classically trained uh, French deformity spine surgeon who trained in Paris. He's been practicing at the Clinique du Parc in uh, Montpellier, France for most of his career. He's an inventor uh, with multiple patents issued, uh, many in the United States. And he's a, an all around uh, kind of Renaissance guy. He, as you start to talk, you'll see he's a, a brilliant uh, artist, a musician. He's a, a great conversationalist. And um, he's a Renaissance man in, in many different uh, ways. And if I can get my slide to work, I'll show you. <laughs> there we go. So, you know, in the classical way, obviously, the original Renaissance man, but, um, you know, I, I've always thought Terry was, was sort of like the John Charnley of, uh, of lumbar disc replacement and cervical disc replacement. I think that one day he will be looked at as the father of modern arthroplasty. He was certainly one of the earliest people who um, had the, the presence of mind to start thinking of something other than a fusion. So for 20 years, he's really been my hero. He started uh, with this implant that you can see um, on the left side, which was titanium and, and poly in a single piece. And he implanted that in um, uh, 64 patients. And then he had the intellectual restraint to stop doing that and observe those patients over several years, something that is very admirable, I think, in an inventor. Um, he then worked with the company various companies to transition to the pro disc that we we know a little bit better as a modular cobalt chrome poly and has now been implanted in well over 100 or maybe even as many as 150,000 patients worldwide. Um, he's been my mentor. Uh, this is a picture of the, the first implant that we did at uh, in the United States when we started the uh, pro disc IDE study. And he was there. He was uh, present at the operating table with Mickey Morgan, myself, and Bart Sachs to make sure that case went well. And he's been my friend for over 20 years. Uh, he was nice enough to invite me to uh, his wedding in south of France with my family. And we've been uh, good friends for a long time. But I first met him several months before the IDE study started. Um, this was in the spring of 2001. Uh, we were still pretty naive about the uh, impending 9-11. Um, uh, and we started that study just three or four weeks after 9-11. It was kind of a chilling time to be starting a national uh, multi-center study. But this was the first ProDisc case on October 3rd in 2011. And Dr. Mornay was at the table. And you can see here's the beauty of surgeons teaching surgeons at the table. You know, he's just making a little minor correction in angulation that made, you know, the, the x-ray from good to excellent. And um, it's a, a very good way for our surgical training. And we've kind of reflected that in arthroplasty training as time has gone on. So I, I visited him in Europe several times, I'm working in his operating room. I'm the thin guy, if you can tell who that is. Um, and he's been to TBI several times uh, operating with me and uh, Dr. Geyer, and, and he knows our access surgeons very well. So we've had a really nice uh, relationship over these two decades. And just I happened to be in the right place at the right time to meet some wonderful people and work with them. Um, Drs. Uh, Balderson and Delamarto, who've since retired, Dr. Jansen and I were the original four teachers. Uh, we got to be really friendly with Dr. Rudy Bertinoli, who's a, a master surgeon in Germany, and some of the, the people who work in industry, Nizra Thangprita, who's retired, and Ron Christensen, whose career has brought him back to uh, working with arthroplasty and protest that uh, just uh, these been some of the, the best people I've worked with uh, in my career and it's been a real boost really nice to be there from the beginning. So I, I told you at the beginning that Terry is kind of an, an artist and has a, a, as big a right brain as he has a left brain. Um, and this is some of his artwork. This is a superimposition of um, the anatomy lesson by Rembrandt with uh, an image taken during that first pro disc case. And it kind of just shows his thinking, um, not just as a technician, but um, as someone who can appreciate the history, the evolution of uh, medical treatment and surgical treatment and how every development is really based on, on people who have come before. And uh, just a beautiful depiction. And he sent me this picture and it's hanging um, in my, one of my patient exam rooms. It's a, just a great um, memory uh, for the, uh, the uh, times we've spent together and the development of the pro disc. So um, it's uh, really an honor to introduce uh, Dr. Terry Marnay, and he's going to talk about uh, uh, long-term experience uh, with the lumbar arthroplasty outside the United States. So again, Terry, I'm sorry we can't be in person to do this, but uh, Zoom makes us the next, the next best thing. So 
I'm going to stop sharing and introduce everybody to uh, Dr. Marnay. Thank you for attending. This will be great. Up to you, Terry. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, I am sharing my screen. If it wants. It's a good one. Yeah, we see you and we can hear you. Okay. I'm, I'm sharing my screen, do you see it? Yes, Terry, we can see your slides, but not on the uh, slideshow. Yeah, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm starting. Perfect. Oh, uh, I, want, I want first to thank uh, CITO Science Foundation to offer me the opportunity to share this experience with you and uh, the TBI friends and especially Rick and, and Jack, and thank Jack for all his kind words. Uh, nobody has never spoken like that, speaking of me. Okay. Total displacement, 30 years of experience, a long term out of US outcomes with Robert Hopelessly. Uh, I thank all my collaborators that has uh, made that type of study possible. My disclosures. As a matter of the spine, as long time ago, was a segmental and pathologic uh, uh, small vision. You had uh, you had uh, deformity people. You had uh, some people taking care about the disc herniation, and nobody was taking care with a global vision about what is the spine function, the cervical spine mobility and mobility and the cervical spine rotation, all the use of that, that was uh, completely ignored and let us uh, perform fusions without thinking it was important to restore motion. And it was the same for the lumbar. We just focused a little bit about flexion extension, not too much about axial rotation. And nobody was understanding 30 years ago the static function in the spine, the role of the five vertebras and uh, the, of the pelvic parameters. In, in 1981, I, I made, a, I made a, a communication in Baden-Württemberg in Germany with uh, Klaus Zilke uh, on the, sp the first one about spine balance dedicated to spondylolisthesis at that moment that I published in 83 and, eight, and after that in 84, I extended the vision, pelvic parameters to the classification of sagittal spinal curves. I summarize that in 1988, and Mrs. Duval Beaupère has uh, found the word incidence, para, incidence, pelvic incidence, published in, in the, in the uh, journal Rashis in 1992. Why I started with spondy because it was obvious that without motion of, of the five lumbar vertebras, it was impossible for this uh, uh, woman to stand. There is a need of compensation and these compensations can only be made by the mobility. And you see here the, the incidence angles more than 100 degrees. The standing position is fundamental and it is guiding all the life of humankind. We recognize Lucy humanity because she was standing. And here we don't know who is this guy, what he's coming from, what is his culture, but we recognize him human because he's standing. We know those modifications on the feet and that leads to this global balance uh, analysis from the ankle, the hips, the center of gravity, and uh, vestibular, uh, the vestibular organs projections. There is a lot of modification, but if we want to focus a little bit, we know that the main modification in the primates to become 
by, to, to come to the bipedalism is the pelvic and hips modifications. We see the reduction of height of the pelvis, and this creates the five lumbar vertebrae. Two for the chimpanzee or for the gorilla, and five for human. So those vertebrae are very important because that the five vertebrae allows the creation of lordosis and so allows the creation of the standing position. It's very important to understand that that is a key point of the verticalization. At the beginning, there is only one curve uh, and we follow in the embryogenesis and uh, growth, the path of the ontogenesis, that means the evolution. We start to have a, a cervical, a cervical lordosis to get an horizontal vision. And after that, we create the lumbar lordosis when we start to stand to achieve a position that allows this equilibrium. And that is because of the lumbar lordosis. So at the beginning, we have a pelvis in retroversion. And with the extension of the hip, we create a progressive anteversion and align L5S1 with the center of the hips. It's very important because that is the creation of the sacral slope. And the sacral slope is the reflex of this modification. Incident angles reflex the pelvic anatomy, it's large or not, it's individual for each pelvic. moves a little bit during life because of the ligaments, the sacroiliac ligaments that can be progressively modified. The pelvic tip that reflects the retroversion of the pelvis, the hips are forward or, or below L5S1, and the sacral slope that is the inclination of uh, the, the sacral plate on the horizontal. We know those, as there is a relationship between those angles. The incidence is, uh, is the addition of sacral slope angle and pelvic tic angle. All of that represent a moment of equilibrium. That means the price as a muscular and ligament to pay to stand and to maintain this mobile complex in a stable position. The moment is the weight, the distance of the of the pelvis and the angle, the sinus of the version, and uh, the resultant is what has been called in all the publications the overhang. So, as small as the the overhang, easier is the stability of the lumbar pelvic complex. We, after that, have made a study to show that there is a relationship between incidence angle and the type of curve. On the left, it's what has been called by Delmas the dynamic curves. On the right, small incidence and flat spine, very static spine. It's important because it reflects the balance corridor. That means that if the patients are, whatever are their curves, if they are in this type of balance, they are in a good position. What is wrong is when they have a small incidence and big curves or a big incidence and not enough curves. And you imagine that it's not so easy to decide for the patient what is a good angle to deliver, because that is what we see in the, a sagittal view, but it is a, st a static standing view. And the patient moves, sits, walk, and there is no good appropriate angle aspect themselves the position. So in 1984, we had no treatments in that type of thing. And even in for fusion, we had not a lot. There is no particular screws. And we are obliged to perform, to use plates by posterior approach or to use 
the technique of anterior scoliosis like uh, Zilke or uh, Dwyer. That's why we started to work and to imagine it was possible to make, to invent a total disc replacement. After, after several years, we went to the definition of a ball and socket, a poly that should be constrained and fixed and killed for the, for the stability. That is the evolution from uh, the conception in 84 to uh, the first implantation in uh, in 1999, as you have seen, the first implantation in USA. 2006 PMA approval here. And uh, last year, two levels and Lord of this shift place have been approved too. It takes time, the approval, sometimes 20 years or more. Yes, you know this picture, you have seen this picture with, uh, with Jack. The ball and socket, because uh, it's important to neutralize the shear forces and to be stable in our positioning. What does it mean? It means that we are facing a pathologic space, no more anterior ligament and no more posterior ligament in the majority of the cases. So there is no more control of the shear forces and all the uh, sliding displacement. So we have to neutralize that and that's why we have chosen the ball and socket. The kill, the kill is to, is done to center and to fix. And it's a security in the lumbar spine because the forces of expulsion are very high. That, all of that comp helps to compensate the anterior and posterior ligament failures and maintain free degree of liberty, flexion extension, lateral inclination, and axial rotation. That's the first drawings in the 80s, until we could make a patent. We have, we, we have been great success in the TV. As you see, we have been successful at the TV before to be completely uh, successful in the uh, spine world, but it's okay. Uh, so the modularity was important because it's better to introduce the two plates without the pulley, so we can place them perfectly, and after that, develop the height and insert the pulley. The one block insertion doesn't allow you always, especially in advanced cases, to position your disc as deep as you would like. The motion must be concentric with the facet. It's very important. So there is a facet curve, a race that we have to follow with the same center than the ball and socket. And it's very important to understand. The kill requests a kill cut to position the, the place perfectly. But it's an advantage because it maintains the centering of the of the implant and also oblige a posterior preparation for the anchorage that is a, a very great security for a perfect positioning. The centering is very important as you see, but we can control it easily with the kill also. After that, you have the plasma pore who creates the ingrowth of bone. Important to understand, as I said, is that we have to neutralize the shear forces. And that is done because of the ball and socket and the fixed core. Every mobile core, every insta horizontal instability creates an obligation to the facets to, to play a role that is, it is not done for them. The facets are there to guide, to limit the rotation, they are not there to stop the shear forces. And that is the role of the ball and socket and the fixed core. Me metal and polycouple has been chosen because it was a PMA approved one, in uh, uh, FDA approved one in uh, uh, 2000, and it has not disturbed us. There is no debris and no osteolysis after 20, 
one year of using this model of implant. The selection of the, the selection of the of the angles is important. We can make a six degree and eleven degree with the superior plate, and now we have the three and three angle that is adapted to L4, L5 principally, and L5 as well, and three degrees in superior plate, eight degree in inferior one, that is very uh, important for the L5 as well level, because we can compensate or recreate a good sacral slope in a good horizontalizing the, the space. Indications, we could speak uh, all this talk about indications. So I will summarize. The patient interview is very important. How long is the low back pain? What is uh, the impeachment of life? The leg pain should be recent. Typically, the good case is a long history of low back pain and a recent problem with the leg. The type of work, how long, the type of medication, the type of real conservative treatment. The vas must be more than five, and the low back pain vas must be higher than the leg pain. It's, we are not treating uh, pure leg pain without low back pain with that. The other history selection is 40% minimum. We will complete our choice with the uh, images, the total spine, the dynamic X-rays, the analysis of the facet and uh, presence of disc herniation, and the MRI aspects on the disc collapses and the modic. Long-term medical studies. Here we present the seven to 21 years clinical outcomes about 1187 patients treated on one and two levels with lumbar disc arthroplasty. It has been elected the best paper in NAS 2021. There are not a lot of very long-term, but it's normal. We started 20 years ago and the others have not the same uh, follow up for their patients. We have considered from that time that it was a priority to use this alternative versus fusion to restore the motion in first intention in the, in the majority of the cases we could do it without contraindication between 18 and 60 years old. We have a quality of bone with a DEXA manus one, that is the most important point to have a good quality of bone. This study we spent, so the results analysis to 21 years with an average of 11 years and eight months. We want to compare one level versus two level to debunk the idea that one level was good, but two levels was not admitted. We have to see that we got the two levels in the United States uh, last year. That been 15 years after the approval of the one level. So it was not so evident for a lot of deciders or colleagues that one level was equivalent to two level. We had to prove that. The other idea to debunk was that people already operated on had not the same level of results as those they were operated. So we have made this comparison. Here we have our group, 550 patients for the one level, no prior surgery, 222 one level prior surgery, two levels, no, no prior surgery, 264, and two levels prior surgery, 151. So we have enough patients in, in each group to make a good analysis and a good statistics that will prove what we want to explore. Uh, the patient has been followed for 3, 6, 12, 24 months and after until the follow-up. The patient demographic age and gender was the same and comparable in all groups between 41 and 43 years old. All data has been collected since the beginning and uh, we have uh, measured o o o for this study ODI and VAS, lumbar and leg. 
complication has been and reoperation rates has been also analyzed and will be presented. We had a great improvement of ODI immediately at three months in the majority of the cases. The, the, the average is 26 points of improvement of gain on the group one to three and 24 points for the group four, but started uh, with a, a less favorable uh, ODI. It took a little bit time for the patient already operated on. That means three months in average more than the, the group one and three with no prior surgery. But at 12 months, 24 months and follow-up, they had exactly the same type of level. You see here the, the gain of 26 points for the group one and the gain of 24 points for the group four but we start from 52, so that means it's very important and the real reduction of all the parameters, vas, leg and vas, back pain. Here is the Audivite curves. You see, it takes here a little bit more time to achieve the same level than the others, between six and 12 months. Here is the same for the group four. So it takes more time for the patient already operated on. For the leg pain, we see that the immediate improvement uh, that demonstrates the capacity of decompression of the anterior approach, and also the, the evolution of the, of, the, of the leg pain here takes more time, but at the end we have exactly the same type and same level of results. So after 12 months, we can say that we have an equivalent result, whatever is a pre-op, Op, uh, what is a pre-op status, never operated on one or two levels. And complications, 49 patients required a revision or a new surgery over seven to 21 years, four percent. And you see the most important, we have uh, the complement decompression and we have also the scars problem or hematomas. If we look to the index re revision rate, we have eight cases that, where we change the disc that represents 0.67%. Typically, you see the group one that means at the beginning of the, of, the, of the study, when we were operating one level, never operated on in priority. So it's uh, more of coming from the learning curve than uh, a real problem. And all of those cases has been uh, described in the two first year of the study. The adjacent level surgery is 1.85%. So if you compare that to the adjacent level uh, surgery in uh, post-fusion, there is nothing to compare whatever is the publication about adjacent surgery on after fusion. 1.85% is the smallest number we can describe at that level. Example, with uh, two levels, and you see uh, the indication with uh, this uh, uh, modic 2 starting at the uh, end disc herniation in L5 S1, but also uh, a disc herniation in L4 L5. We have changed the two levels. It's a 45 degree of incidence, 27 degree of sacral slope. Here is a pre op motion. And the the lumbar pelvic mobility complex only 63 degrees. And if you look to the patient after the surgery, 47 degrees in the, in the sacral slope motion, that is the pelvic motion. We have uh, 20 degrees in L4, L5, 
13 in L5 S1, and the global motion, that means the L1 ray since 97 degrees, we have a gain of 34 degrees. So in the large group of total discard tropacy patients evaluated, this study demonstrates a robust long-term clinical study and results. The patient has significant and maintained reduction in disability for ODI spore and uh, visual analogic scales. We confirm here that the two levels of TDR uh, have the same equivalent results with the one and the excellent outcomes for the patients who had already a prior surgery versus those who have never been operated on. Now we will focus on the analysis of the motion. You have already seen that the motion in my presentation is not only measuring L4, L5, L5S1, but also the consequences above and below of the total disc replacement, that means the restoration of the motion. And, the, and so the restoration of motion is huge and beyond such a measure of L4, L5 or L5S1 angles. So we have made a 235 uh, cases study with uh, uh, a group of two levels compared to a group of hybrids. All the hybrids were L5, L4, L5 disc and disc and L5 S1 fusion. We wanted to debunk the idea that L5 S1 fusion is compensated by more lumbar or pelvic mobility because it was not what we were seeing in our patients. So that will demonstrate that L5S1 has a fundamental role in the global motion. And if you fuse L5S1, you don't get the same result and you lose motion compared to if you replace it. So 235 patients, two levels poly cell 4 L5, L5, S1, 170, and a control group of hybrid with a NALIF uh, and uh, with a NALIF and uh, a total disc replacement L4, L5. The indication were the same. It's not a selection of hybrid because L5, S1 was not a good candidate. It was the groups has been generated and the hybrid group has been generated by the, re, um, the reimbursement policy. So that means that all the patients or the 65 patients of the hybrid group were candidates for a two level, but the insurance has not reimbursed, uh, did not want to reimburse the second level, so we were obliged to fuse. So that means the two original groups are the same and, uh, but they got a different treatment for a same surgical indication. Eight gender general conditions were equivalent in two groups. We also have looked to the, the risk of uh, bias by the pain. If the hybrid or the prolisk were more painful uh, than the other group, we had a uh, a bias about the motion. So we have seen that, as you can see, the, there is an equiv complete equivalence between the two level prolisk and the hybrid about the clinical results. Uh, and this difference is not really significant at the statistical point of view on the ODI, on the visual analogic scale. You see here, that's the back pain and that's the leg pain. And uh, so we could compare in post-op their mobility without risk. The only difference we found in uh, this analysis was the return to work, two months and 12 days for the two-level prolisk versus five months and 11 days for the hybrid cases. So we have made the same analysis with uh, pelvic parameters, X-rays, and measure the range of motion and the gain for each level you will see. So that means that uh, we have a global motion analysis, Se 17 degrees here in extension in post-op, zero and zero, so we can measure the, the motion. We have the low doses in extension, 60, minus eight in uh, inflation, that means that we have 68 degrees of uh, range of motion, 
Et oui, monsieur, the pelvic worm, as I, I have already showed you, uh, with this angle made by the two sacral slope extension and flexion, that reflects the participation of the pelvis, 64 degrees here, and the participation and the global race, L1 race, 130. That is our criteria of measures. So, as I say, the disc motion benefit cannot be limited to interspace range of motion. We have controlled the, the pelvic parameters to see if we had equivalent groups and if there were some big influence, especially in post-op with the, with the fusion group. If they don't, if the fusion group has not changed its pelvic parameters. As you see here, we have almost the same results as that doesn't change a lot. The sacral pre-op, uh, so pre-op is was 30, 34 here, 35 is a hybrid group. As the pelvic tick pre-op, 15 degrees in uh, two levels and 17 in the hybrid. And you see that there is not a lot of difference and modification after the surgery. L4, L5 motion. So we measure L4, L5 motion pre and post-op. Uh, for the two levels, we here we measure the, the, the range of motion pre-op 10 degree, L5 is one 6 degree, and after that it's 24 degree and 17 degree in post-op. It's not the same in the in the in the case of hybrid because we lose we lose the motion of uh, L5 S1 to maintain the motion that is the by the cage of 10 degree. All the patients of those groups, of the hybrid group, had a 10, 10 degree cage. So what are the results of the L4, L5 motion? We see, so the, the superior line is always two level TDR. We see that we have a gain in fashion of 1.5 and a global range of motion of gain of eight degrees compared to the pre-op. On the hybrid group, we have only three 0.7 degree. Passed up uh, on the range of motion for L4 and 5 is the group uh, two levels and the group uh, and the group hybrid. global lumbar range of motion from L1 to S1. We have the pre-op analysis here. You see minus 11 in post-op, and it was only minus three here. It was a very, very flexible spine, despite the, the degenerative disease of L4, L5, L5, S1. I have, take, I have showed you a favorable, case, a favorable case. If we look to the this case, we see that uh, there is a limit immediately in the spine motion and the lumbar motion in post-op. What is the result? Two levels total disc replacement. We see that the, the gain in flexion is eight degree. And for a lot, once more, like for L4, L5, we have a loss in the hybrid group in post-op compared to the pre-op. And the global gain for lumbar motion is 20 degrees for a loss of 1.5 degrees. That means that what we have lost fusing L5, S1 is not compensated by the other disc, even by L4, L5 above. And we have seen that L4, L5 above was not favorable uh, when we have a fusion below. So there is a real difference here in the global motion between the, pre, the two level TDR and the hybrid group. The pelvic rom. The pelvic rom, so this angle I uh, described to measure the, the pelvic participation we've made by the sacral slope, extension, flexion angle. We see that there is a, a it's here 37 degree, and here we have a eight, 
we have a sacral slope 83, 23, that is 60 degrees. So there is a gain in the posterior pelvic motion that allows this flexion of the pelvis uh, through, through the hip mobility. It's very important because it's, uh, it's a great participation to the global mobility of the spine. That is for hybrid, you see. We had 37 before the surgery, but here, after the surgery, it's less, it's always 37. That has a move. That means that the fusion has locked completely the pelvic motion. And if we look to the, the, the results and the statistics, we see that the sacral slope inflection have a gain of 16 degrees, compared to 8 degrees here. And we have a loss of... Uh, in the hybrid group. So we have a loss on L4 and 5, we have a loss on the lower spine, we have a loss on pelvic motion. So obviously we will have the global result that is in conformity with all the measures we, we already only a gain of 19 degree, you see. If we look to the... Compared to hybrids, where we have a 63 degree of... Uh, for a gain... has limited the global motion of the lumbar pelvic complex. Some uh, examples you can see here. L1 race for this case, 35, Lord of the Swarm, 25. And in post-op, we have 54 of Lord of the Swarm and 113 of L1 race. Another case, is pre-op we had a good mobility. As a good pelvic 50 that compensates all, 50 degree of pelvic form. In post-op, we regain, we had a good pelvic form, of L1 race. The same here, we can see from 50 to 105 degrees for the L1 race, because we have a great gain of the pelvic form, we have a good gain of, uh, on L4, L5, and we have a 30, 30, uh, 32 degrees of gain on the Lord of this form. So L5, S1, moving brings more than its own mobility. It gives mobility for the disc above, for the global spine above, and for the pelvic below. So two fundamental measures must be added in pre and post-op, the pelvic rhomb and the L1 race. Second conclusion, there is an equivalence, as you have seen, on the one and two levels, prior surgery versus non prior surgery. It's very important for our indication and to extend our indications for two levels, whatever is the status, if they have been operated on or not before. The second point is the role of the disc. It's, uh, it goes beyond only the mobility of the space, and especially L5 as well, because it's this mobility controls the mobility above and the mobility below. 
So there is a great superiority as a motion point of view between two level TDR versus hybrid in L4 S1 surgery. Thank you for your attention. Harry, thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. You, as I've, uh, I think I introduced you. You are a very deep thinker, and you just proved the point. So, um, we appreciate it. Hey, Terry, in the hybrids, that was a, a lovely way of showing that um, they're not equivalent to a two-level disc replacement. That the range of motion is certainly better. Um, it, it, have you seen a difference in outcomes between patients who had a rent had to get a hybrid versus those who got a two-level disc replacement because of their insurance? Uh, no, as you have seen, uh, I have showed that I have, in this, I have selected, the, I have not selected the, the patients according to their outcomes. But I wanted to control if I had a bias to analyze, because if they were painful after that, uh, the mob measuring the mobility in painful people is not very interesting, uh, because uh, it's a real bias. So I have control, and as you have seen, no. We cannot say there is a real statistical difference. It's a bit better for the two levels, but I, it would be uh, not fair to say that hybrid has bad outcomes. No, that is the leg pain is better because we decompress. We do the same release. We do the same surgery. Um, the, the only difference is uh, back to work. Back to work is. Uh, is two months, 11 days versus five months uh, and 20 days. That is three, three months of differences is the average. Uh, it proves that we wait probably more to push them because of the fusion and we have to weigh the fusion. But there is something I could not define. And probably it's why I have been tempted to make this study, not only for the, for the motion, because at the beginning, I was thinking that uh, when you fuse, it's compensated by the pelvis below and by the lumbar spine. Okay, I have, uh, uh, it took me 30 or 40 years to, to debunk this uh, preconceived idea that I have received from my mentors. And probably, they, but if you look to the literature, nobody has never analyzed after a fusion, if there is a compensation above or below. Uh, that was, uh, I would say, a theoretical thinking that was not uh, that was not a good one. No, the difference is that the hybrid people are satisfied, but they, when you have a fusion, they never use the word miracle, reborn, renaissance. And I was wondering why the exp what, what was coming from, and. After that, I understood when I interview them now. And they say, yes, I am fine because I have, a, I can say it's, it's perfect because I have no more pain. But I have not recovered my uh, mobility that I had uh, before the disease. At the opposite of the two levels, and those who are not fused, we say it's a miracle because I, re I refine my spine and my mobility I had 10 or 15 years ago. That is, that is a clinical... Uh, difference. Yeah, and I think we tell them the same thing, Terry. We, we tell them that theoretically the two-level disc replacement will be better for you, but uh, some patients are in the position where they either accept a hybrid or they have to come up with the cash, um, which for, for many people is very difficult. I say to them, don't take your, your child's college money uh, for the second level disc replacement. Yeah. I think you should accept the hybrid. So I, I think the situation is similar for both. But this is the first time I've, I've heard, seen data or heard you speak about preserving pelvic motion um, by having a disc replacement at L5-S1 versus the ALIF as part of a hybrid. So, you know, we've been focused more on the lumbar spine, but it's interesting that you've taken it down to, to the pelvis. And, uh, you know, it, it takes someone like you, I think, to, to make that association. Yeah. Harry. Uh, the, the circle is closed. I started with the pelvic parameters, and <laughs> I finish now to invent an angle to measure the, the pelvic motion. Terry, I just want to echo some of what Jack said, because we even had partners that said, oh, there's no motion at L5-S1, and, and not just our partners, other arthroplasties, that, you know, it just as well do a, a, you know, a hybrid. But I think you showed very nicely, you know, that you preserve the motion all the way around. Now, long term clinically, is it going to make a difference? Not sure. But I still believe that 
you know, if we can get away with um, or get an approval for the two level, then we do so. Now, the good news here in the U.S., we're starting to see insurance companies approve two level disc replacement. So it's making it easier for us. But the other thing I want to compliment you on, and this is really for our young associates, that you were the true uh, Oh, I guess pioneer in all the pelvic parameters and spinal parameters uh, back in the early 80s. And it, it was truly visionary. And I have to say that, you know, I agree with what Jack said that someday you're going to go down as a, a very, very famous person. You're very famous now, but <laughs> even more famous. In my uh, eyes. That, that, that's not Rick. <laughs> I would say I am a, a little bit uh, uh, confused when I hear those words because coming from you it's a it's a great it's a great compliment for me you know uh, the, the fact is uh, for the long term uh, we have a, uh, I have I, I have not made you you have seen my my long term study 20, 21 years uh, it does not include hybrid cases it's one and two levels uh, total disc replacement comparison uh, I am starting now with all I have made. If I have time, uh, I need a, a little bit of COVID confinement more to do that. Uh, uh, measure L3, L4. That means that uh, does it affect L3, L4 evolution? That is interesting to look. If there is a difference between L3, L4 with a fusion, uh, even if it's a one level fusion, or if the L3, L4 uh, disc above. But the fact is we cannot uh, blame anything because whatever is uh, the groups we are facing, the level of adjacent disease is so low, 1.8%, that we cannot make any statistics. And even I have uh, uh, two or three uh, adjacent on one hand and I will have 10 on the other hand, on the on hundreds and hundreds of cases, that means nothing as a statistical point of view. It just it will just be an uh, an impression, and that's not enough to convince people. But I think that with that type of study, we can convince insurance companies that it's not equivalent, and there is a better preservation for them for the future. Uh, All right, Doctor. Yes. I have one question for you. When you see that, when you see that the mobility above a fusion is not as good as the mobility over a uh, normal motion, I wonder where, I think that the, and I've seen, there is no hypermobility on the disc above a fusion. So the fact that it's suffering, the fact it's suffering, the disc above will, will degenerate, it's not because we overuse it as a range of motion. It's probably because of the pressure we put that reverse uh, uh, nutrition of the disc. It's perhaps because the less it moves, the less it is uh, uh, in good shape. We know that we immobilize the disc, it will have a regression. I have not, but I am not sure that our pre -idea, preconceived idea about uh, the disc above degenerates because we overuse it, yes, but not in motion. We overuse it in something else, pressure, absorption of shock. Uh, but I am not sure that it's not hyper motion because I would like if you have uh, the open opportunity to make this study above your fusion to control there. Uh, if you have the pre and post dynamic to see if they are mo moving more when they have been over, over a fusion. I am not sure. Unfortunately, we have no dynamic, we have no dynamic X-rays of a uh, fusion, so I cannot make this study. Harry, I think sagittal alignment, the position of the fusion is also important because at TBI, we've always been intuitive to restore lordosis with our lumbosacral fusions. And we have very, very little adjacent level disease above our fusions, but you see other patients who are fused either neutral or in kyphosis at L4 to the sacrum, L5 to the sacrum, and they um, are the ones who come back at 10 years to need more surgery. Dr. Jens Chapman is either in outer space or in Seattle. I'm not sure yeah. where, but he has his hand up. So let's see what, uh, what Jens has to say. 
Go ahead, Yitz. Um, I have nothing to add to the admiration uh, expressed by Dr. Ziegler, Geyer, and Blumenthal. I am a fan and uh, a uh, completely conflicted admirer of your contributions. Thank you, Thierry. Now, a constructive question I'd like to ask is the following. Whenever I see studies from other cultural circles, I wonder about the application across the globe, which is represented behind me here, and specifically to our country. Um, we do have these things called Coca-Cola, KFC, and McDonald's, um, and uh, the things that you in France just despise. Uh, you have uh, healthy uh, red wine and Mediterranean diet, etc. Now to the question specifically, uh, how does body weight and fitness affect um, the outcomes? Uh, my challenge is, even if I have everything radiographically perfect, I have so many weight challenged patients and I suspect having had some European roots that there may be a difference in terms of the composition of the patient's body and psyche. So how much is this culturally transferable and specifically under the vignette of body weight? Sorry for the wordy question. No, 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 it's good. Uh, thank you for, for your words. Uh, the average, uh, when I made my first study of the 64 patients for the first, between 90 and 92, the average of weight was 71 kilos, 142 pounds. That's very small. Uh, it was 60, 60 for, the, for the ladies and 80 for the, for the males. Uh, in this, we have exactly the same type of, uh, it, I think the population has uh, taken a little bit weight because uh, it's, uh, it's 74 or 75 uh, kilos in average so uh, they they are becoming uh, perhaps uh, uh, a bit bigger or perhaps i have uh, changed a bit uh, my uh, selections putting uh, people a bit uh, uh, less so healthy yeah uh, i can tell that uh, if they are obese and more than 100 kilos uh, we don't operate on them uh, we ask them to lose weight if they lose weight, we operate on them. If they don't lose weight, they will uh, stay like they are. We don't. We don't operate. We don't operate. Uh, we don't put this on uh, uh, very heavy people for two reasons: access. Comp access is complex, and uh, uh, even they have the very, very, very heavy people. Even they have a good DEXA, are always good candidates for a bone fracture. Terry, Terry, we, we make it easy. We do the elbow test. So I put my elbow on the table while they're laying down. And if their belly comes higher than my wrist, I say, listen, I can help you, but you have to help yourself. I say, yeah. you don't have instruments long enough to get to your spine. Yeah. Uh, I, I say, I say uh, in, some, in some patients, the six months of conservative treatment starts by uh, special, by a uh, a visit to the specialist of diet and uh, and weight losing. If you don't change your habits, it's okay. But I want to comfort Jens. We have McDonald's, uh, Burger King, KFC, and Coca-Cola every corner. It's the worst thing the U.S. exported to the foreign countries. Yeah. Maybe you should sanction us also, or we should sanction yes. you or something like that. <laughs> Terry, thank you again. Yeah, it's just wonderful to uh, listen to you. And I'm so glad we had uh, such a great audience. We've gotten wonderful comments in our chat room. So uh, we wish you safe travels and uh, next time um, an in-person visit and we'll get you uh, a good plate of Texas barbecue. Yes, and I, I hope I can, I can make the inauguration of your new, of your new uh, teaching room so we can make a... a we can make another type of talk uh, with uh, C Seattle Science uh, Foundation, but, but with an audience. That's Hi. A deal. That's a deal. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll want you and Jens to come in person when we open yeah. new teaching. Yeah. And Alexis and Linda. 
Thanks, folks. Sure. All right. Thank you, Seattle Science Foundation. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. And uh, I guess uh, most of us have to go to work. So Harry, we, thanks we again so it. much. Next Thank time. You. Thank you, everyone, for your kind words and for your attention. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Terry, safe travels on uh, for the rest of your journey. Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, oh, it will. I hope so, too. And uh, uh, all the best back home. But we'll see you soon, I hope. All right. Thank you, Alexis. Alexis, you didn't put the... Um, the note up for the uh, no there's no the, no cme for oh, this so, okay yeah okay yeah right. yeah okay. sorry no cme for this one that's, that's right. right yeah we, yeah what's right. one it's okay thank you alexis <laughs> all right have a great one okay, alexis bye -bye. yeah thanks a lot yeah god it's too bad about the uh the internet but you know that's uh we'll we'll know next time to buy i know up. i really yeah. think i can call ahead to the hotel and uh get secure wi-fi yeah, each time I was going, oh, please come back. Please come back. I know. I was like, my hair was turned in white. I felt the same I thing. I thought, oh, my God, here but, goes. Yeah, but what a, it was just a great talk. That's, um, you know, he shares his brilliance very nicely. Well, it's such a treat because, I mean, he goes way back to that. The very